Good morning and welcome to St. Dominic Weekend here at Providence College, or at least to St. Dominic Day. Uh, my name is Father Kevin Robb. I'm the Associate Vice President for Mission and Ministry. Uh, on off days, I'm the Associate Treasurer of the college. But as Associate Vice President, I chair the Selection Committee for the Smith Fellowship Program, and I'm the director of the program. In uh, 2008, Father Joseph Guido, who was then uh, the first Vice President for Mission and Ministry at Providence College, uh, had an idea, and as uh, was the case in his years, uh, whenever he had an idea, he shared it, and other people put it into effect. So he announced that we would have this program and said, Kevin, you're going to uh, take care of it. And so here I am six years later. Uh, the initial donor was Kate Murray, who was a member of the Board of Trustees then, and a close friend of Father Philip A. Smith, uh, the 11th president of the college, 1994 to 2005, and who died suddenly following surgery in November of 2007. Uh, most of you alums here will remember him. And the Smith Center for the Arts is dedicated in his memory. Uh, this is the program dedicated in his memory. And over five summers, 2009 to 2013, we have sent 32 Smith Fellows <clears throat> all over the world. And we have done so with no expense to them or their family. This is completely supported by contributions from former trustees as well as current trustees plus another couple of supporters. If you want more information on <clears throat> what's come before and up to now, go to providence.edu, click on Catholic and Dominican along the top ribbon, and there's the uh, Catholic and Dominican page, and you'll see Smith Fellowship Program. Our entire history is there. The blogs of 29 out of 32 of the Smith Fellows and presentations uh, by them when they returned um, for 2013, 2012, and 2011. Uh, the, the three 2013 presentations were just posted yesterday, and uh, this presentation will go up in a little over a week. The Smith Fellowship Program invites students to dream, to identify a place where they would like to do personal research, study, or personal service in a context that is Catholic and Dominican. The Dominican part of it can be with Dominican friars or with Dominican sisters. And some of the most popular service uh, projects have taken place in Kenya, Australia and the Solomon Islands, and beginning this past summer in uh, South Africa. Today we have a special Smith Fellowship presentation um, that is going to focus on uh, the Haitian project and it's Louverture Cleary School, a few miles outside Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, we had one Smith Fellow down there this past summer, Molly O'Donohue, who will be presenting. And early in her time down there, she was down there for about four weeks, um, Father Cuddy, our chaplain, and who went with you, James? and Sarah Atwood, uh, a campus minister here with us for a year, accompanied eight students from campus ministry down for what was supposed to be a week's service project. Uh, they'll tell you what happened along the way. Uh, they spent half of it in Miami and not on the beach. Actually, Father Cuddy was very industrious and hooked them up with 
uh, Mother Teresa's Daughters of Charity, Sisters of Charity in Miami. Anyway, Scott Thompson, uh, Claire Chambers are going to talk about that experience, and Molly is going to talk about her Smith Fellowship experience. So I think Scott's going to begin, correct? All yours. And I'm a senior here at Providence College. So I'm going to begin talking a little bit about um, the Haitian project in general, um, the school, Louisville Cleary, uh, where we volunteered, and a little bit about the program with campus ministry and the relationship Providence College has with the Haitian project. Um, so to begin, the Haitian project is an organization run out of Providence, Rhode Island, um, that owns and orchestrates a school in Port-au-Prince called the Louverture Cleary School. It is a school that houses about 360 students, um, kind of ages between what we would call um, sixth or seventh grade through end of high school. Um, the students board there during the, during the week um, and go home on the weekends. Um, the Haitian Project is uh, run by a deacon out of the Diocese of Providence named Deacon Patrick Moynihan. Um, he's also the president of the Louverture Cleary School and lives down across the street from the school with his entire family. Um, something that Deacon Moynihan really emphasized when we were down there was the importance of Catholic education to these students. He talked about how it needs to be a, a holistic teaching to the students about what it means to be human. Um, that they need to be focusing on giving back to each other and giving back to their country in order to, uh, in order to promote it and to get it out of the kind of struggle it has been experiencing over the past uh, few decades. This is a picture of most of the students um, in their kind of, that's, that's effectively their gym. Um, now, something else that the Haitian Project has really started to do over the past couple years is sponsor full-time volunteers. Um, so right now, there are four Providence College graduates um, at the Louverture Cleary School teaching and working. There's one full-time staff member, another one who is on her second year as a full-time volunteer, and two graduates who just graduated in May are down there for the first year teaching religion, English, Spanish, um, now, Providence College and the Haitian Project have just started to begun um, a program, which is up and coming, and it's not yet in effect, um, but it's a program where you will be able to go to Haiti and volunteer at the Louverture Cleary School as a teacher for two years of service. And during the summers, when you come back to the States, you can get your master's at Providence College completely paid for. Um, so that is a program up and coming and we're certainly excited to see that come to fruition. Um, now, the school's mission and their motto is Matthew 10.8, um, which is what you have received for free, you must give for free. This is something that they really try to instill in all of their students, um, that the education that they are receiving, which is a free education, a free Catholic education, they have to take what they receive from that and after they go to university, to come back to Haiti and help rebuild the country. Many of the students will graduate and they will go to university either in Port-au-Prince or in the United States. And what they try to help the students understand is the importance of coming back to Haiti and being professionals in Haiti. Something that I learned um, over my experience down there was that you know, Haiti can't be fixed with a paycheck. Um, and this is something Deacon Moynihan really, really focused on. Um, his understanding is that the key to solving Haiti's problem, um, Haiti's poverty, is education. That it starts in the schools, that these the young people need to be educated, 
so they can go to university, come back, and be professionals, help build the economy, and get the country back up on its feet. Um, now, something about what the Haitian Project does for its volunteers, that, which is really unique, um, is that when you go down there, you are completely immersed in their culture and in their society. Um, Deacon Moynihan prides himself on that they do not change anything for volunteers. So it's not we go down there and he asks us, like, oh, what would you guys like to do? It's you're down there and you're doing exactly what the school is doing every single day. So it's a 5.30 a.m. wake up, prayer, go through the school day, recess time, work hour, um, prayer, dinner, study, bed, and you do it all over again the next day. Um, so that's something really unique, I think. A lot of other service trips, um, even some you know, the, the other Smith Fellowships, you kind of build exactly what you want to do, what you're going to do. The Haiti Immersion Trip, through campus ministry, we were completely immersed in the life of the students every day. Now to kind of talk about just how myself and Claire ended up here, um, after announcing that these mission trips were going to happen, um, they had a few, we held a few informational sessions, um, and then applications were due. I think there were around 60 or 70 applica applications for eight spots on the Haiti immersion trip. Um, we went through an interview process with um, Rich Lumney and Father James, um, and from there, they chose eight students to go down. After spring break in March is when this trip really started. We had weekly meetings. Um, at these meetings, we would pray together. Um, we would learn about Haiti. Um, one week we went to the, I think I believe it was the Brown Charter Library at um, Brown University and looked at some of their uh, documents of Haiti, just kind of trying to get a, an understanding of its history, an understanding of the culture down there. Um, and so I also think that's something really unique to this program, where you know, we started eight weeks before we went down. We got to know the group. We got to know the other students we were going to be traveling with, um, something which I really think was beneficial. Now, just to give you a little idea of where we were exactly, um, the school is located just north of Port-au-Prince um, in a rather, it's an extremely impoverished area, as you can imagine. Um, Claire will be talking more about that. Um, and then this is a aerial view of the school. You'll see the rectangle in yellow is, makes up most of the classrooms and uh, dormitories for the students. Uh, in the red is their, effectively it's their soccer field. Um, and the blue makes up their, you can see their basketball court there, um, and the program which they have for younger children in Haiti called Timon, um, where they, you know, they bring children there, uh, that way they have something to eat and begin to give them a, a more elementary education. Um, but now I believe I'm going to pass it off to Claire, who will talk more about what the we did down there, as far as specifically the things we were kind of doing each and every day. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Claire Chambers. I'm a junior at Providence College. Um, and I'm going to be talking more about just everything that we did once we actually made it to Haiti, which is a long story. Uh, so everything was going fine. We had our flight out of Boston, landed in Miami, only to find out that there was a plane accident uh, at the Haitian airport on the runway, causing us to have a two-day layover in Miami. Uh, our trip was only supposed to be five days, so taking two days out of it was a pretty decent-sized chunk. So uh, needless to say, we were a little upset about that, and frustrated and didn't know how we were going to spend our two days while we were stuck in Miami. But thanks to Father Cuddy, uh, he was able to hook us up with the Missionaries of Charity. Uh, we worked at a soup kitchen in downtown Miami where we served hundreds of homeless people each day. Um, and the work that the sisters did there was absolutely incredible. Um, 
And even though I was upset to not get to the Louverture Cleary School right away, I have to say that my time in Miami was very beneficial and I really enjoyed working with the sisters there. And I think a lot of my, uh, my group members did as well. Um, so once we finally got to Haiti, we arrived at night, so when we drove in, we couldn't really see what was uh, going on outside of our van windows um, until we left two days later. So we got to the school and quickly went to bed and got up the next morning at 5.30 a.m., which I think was shocking for most of us. <laughs> We're not used to that. Um, and we had morning prayer, and we had this every morning when we were there with all the volunteers. Uh, and it was a nice way to start the day with everyone and really um, form our intentions for the day and reflect on our experiences from the previous day uh, and really take some time to realize how great of an opportunity that we had to be at the Louverture Cleary School um, as the eight students selected to be there. Uh, later on in the day, these are some pictures of the chapel that is on campus uh, at Louverture Cleary. Uh, we had a mass with some of the students, and I have never seen a group of young people so excited to be at mass. Their singing was out of this world. They were so engaged in the homily that Father Cuddy gave. Um, and it was, it was just an amazing experience to see how they just, they really loved being there. And you could tell that they were so extremely thankful for the opportunity they had to be at the school. Uh, so that was, it was incredible just to see that. And it was, it was a change to see from our 1030 Mass here, where I, I am so excited to go to every week, because you get so many young people all together um, giving thanks. And to go here and see that they do the same thing, um, it, was, it was a great experience. Uh, so after we had our morning prayer, we all got to split up and go with different volunteers into some of their classrooms uh, and see some of the things that they were teaching. Uh, at the Louverture Cleary School, the students there learn four languages. Um, they start with Creole, which is their own language, and they learn French, Spanish, and English as their fourth language. And some of the students that I had the opportunity to talk to, um, English is their fourth language, and they were speaking perfectly to me, which I was absolutely amazed at. Um, these are some of the pictures from the classroom. You can see on the top left, um, that's Scott. I think that was in an English classroom. Um, and the top right, that was one of the Spanish classrooms that I was in. Um, and all the students were so, again, engaged uh, in the class, and you could really tell that the volunteers were so passionate about what they were doing and what they were teaching. Um, and even though they didn't have the great school supplies and technology that we have here, they still made use of books that were sent to them or donated, and um, they were able to, you know, create a great classroom environment with the little things that they had. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about this wall pour. The bottom right is the finished product. Uh, we worked hard all day uh, pouring the cement wall, and I was forewarned by Father Cuddy that Deacon Moynihan drives a hard ship, and I didn't realize that how strict he is until I got there. But the amount of teamwork that went into this wall pour was absolutely incredible, and I've never... I've played a lot of sports and been on a lot of teams, but I've never been involved in the amount of teamwork that it took to do this. We had students from the school, along with Deacon Moynihan, who was right there by our side working with us the whole time, shoveling piles of sand and rock into 50-pound buckets and hauling it down a line of students, dumping water in, putting the cement in, mixing it up, and then sending buckets of wet cement up scaffolding on the top left, and then pouring it into the mold. And we continued to do this, I think, for probably four hours. Um, and it was so exhausting, but if you just stopped for a minute and stepped back and looked at how each person had this little job, but together we were able to create this wall um, with the, you know, the little technology, again, that we had, it was, it was amazing to see. And when I got the email with this picture after I came back over the summer and saw... Uh, what we had created and that they'd painted the fryer on it. It made me feel so wonderful that I was able to be a part of that and have that experience that I can share with all my family and friends and with you here today. 
Uh, these are some pictures. This is their, their basketball court or their gym. Um, and we were able to participate in one of their gym classes where we learned Zumba. Um, I'm not a very coordinated dancer, but I still had a lot of fun. Um, and these are some of the younger students who don't speak English as well as some of the older students, but regardless of the language barrier, they all ran up to us and grabbed our hands and got us right in there. And it was fun. Even though we had two days, we didn't have as much interaction with the students as we would have liked. But I think this was one of my favorite parts um, of the time that I spent down there just because I was really able to see the students interact and how happy they were. And even though they didn't have like a fancy gym or basketball court and dodgeballs and all of that, they had so much fun just dancing out on a blacktop with a little iPod playing some music. And that was, it was so much fun. I wish I could go back and dance with them again. <laughs> uh, this is their production. At the end of each school year, they always run a production of some sort. And we were lucky enough that we were there for... Uh, their presentation of Guys and Dolls. Uh, I was very impressed, actually. They took the entire thing and translated it from English to Creole. So they spoke all the, the lines in Creole so the younger students who aren't so good at English could understand. And then they did all the songs in English. So most of us had no idea what was going on <laughs> when they were speaking. But their acting was so great, and you could tell that they were really into it. And the entire student body was under this tarp that they set up because it was so hot that day. Um, and they just pulled all the classroom chairs out and dragged benches from random rooms and it all piled in there. There's, I don't know, probably 100 kids under that tent. And they were all squished together, and it was 90-plus degrees. But they were laughing hysterically, and you could just hear their laughter filling up the entire campus. And it was, some, it was so amazing to watch how they just came together as a community at the end of the school year, and all the kids had worked so hard. And one of their volunteers, I think it was her last year there, Emily, she did a great job of coordinating the whole production. Um, and you could see that the students there were so thankful that she was able to help them put that on. Um, so this is one of the pictures I took on our way out. After two days, when we drove back to the airport, it was light out, so we could actually see what exactly was going on outside of the gates of the Louisville Cleary School. And I'd always had an idea in my head of what I thought a third world country would look like, and I was absolutely blown away by some of the things that I saw. Uh, the amount of poverty is, it's just crazy. I, I can't even really put it into words. Um, there is pollution in the rivers. There was garbage on the sides of the roads. There were kids running around with no shoes and moms just sitting on the side trying to sell like bananas or anything they had just to get a little money so they could feed their children. Um, and that's when I really realized that what the Louvre Cleary School is doing and their long-term goal of getting students in who uh, they can give an education to in hopes that they go out and get a better education, whether they become a doctor or a lawyer, whatever it is that they feel passionate about and are able to come back to Haiti and help out their country in some way. I think it's a great idea, and I hope that they continue to get funding to run the school and hopefully to open more schools like it down there in Haiti or anywhere else around the world because it's really a great thing what they're doing, and I fully support it. I hope all of you do as well. Um, so that was a bit about our trip. I'm going to turn it over to Molly now, and she can talk a little bit about her time with Deacon Moynihan and her project on cell phone use in Haiti. Thank you. Hello. My name is Molly O'Donoghue. I'm a junior here. I'm a finance major and Spanish minor. Um, so to start off with how I ended up in Haiti. Uh, I initially heard about the Haitian project through D, uh, Father Cuddy's trip uh, the summer before that I, I went down there. Um, so I started looking into and researching the Haitian project and what they do. And something that appealed to me, what Scott was talking about before, was their charism. Uh, what we receive for free, we must give for free. Uh, as a student here in the liberal arts honors program, uh, I was lucky enough to be granted the gift of education. With that education, I wanted to do something. I wanted to show 
um, use my Providence College in education and use the many different things that I learned here and use that to influence another person's education, spread um, the Dominican and Catholic values and um, teach them, at, um, influence the education of someone else in Haiti. Uh, so when I got to LCS, uh, because the school year ends in June, I was only there for four weeks, uh, but it was an amazing four weeks that I was there. Uh, so I got there um, and right away I realized, like Claire did, what a different situation I was getting myself into. Uh, as a PC student and as just someone, I've always done participate in service, but I had never really stepped outside of my uh, comfort zone and gone to a third world country and saw life outside of the United States. So for me, this was an amazing experience just to see um, what exactly I was getting myself into and what the future graduates of the Louis Cleary School were going to have to deal with, the problems they were going to have to face, and um, what they were going to do with it afterwards. And so that was uh, just, it was crazy for me to see um, four years or five years after the earthquake, there was still so much destruction. Um, there were people living in ten cities. There were everyone all over the streets. Um, infrastructure was basically in ex non-existent. Uh, the roads were, some of them were paved, some weren't. Um, so it was definitely a new experience for me. So this is where I, st oh, sorry. This is where I stayed. Um, in the top left corner is the picture of the Palais, um, the house where all the volunteers live on campus. Um, so I stayed in the Palais with, uh, I lived directly with three other roommates. Two of them were uh, volunteers. One of them was actually a PC graduate, Tara Kingsley. Uh, she taught Spanish at LCS and uh, was a great help while I was there. She, it was so nice to have a little piece of PC, a little piece of home while I was there and it was a great initial connection. Uh, my other roommate, Megan, was a math teacher on campus, and our third roommate, her name was Miriam. She's actually currently serving as the principal at Louverture Cleary School. Um, so we had a different mix of cultures and a great dynamic in the room. Uh, other people who lived in the Palais were um, junior Haitian volunteers who were members of the junior staff. So they had graduated from LCS um, in the recent years and had received a scholarship from the school. So they were going on. Um, and using their scholarship to go to university in Haiti, but also were working at the school at the same time, so in order to pay back that education. And there were also a few members of the Haitian staff who also lived in the Palais. Uh, to the right is a picture of one of the dorms on the campus. Um, that is where a boys' dormitory on the top two, uh, is the top two stories, and the bottom story is uh, held a few classrooms. And uh, to the bottom left is the soccer field. So when I arrived uh, around three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, it was 95 to 100 degrees, and I walked outside and I saw people, um, I got to watch the boys junior varsity soccer team practice, which was something I was really excited about. I played travel soccer um, basically my entire life. So for me, it was a great initial connection. Um, it was ex exciting to see it played on an international level. Um, in or an international location, I should say. Um, and also, right on the soccer field is the incinerator. So as was mentioned before, the community uh, that is on the LCS campus um, is very self-sufficient. So they do a lot of their work. They um, participate in cleaning up the school every day. They help outside of the community, but they focus on the community that they have developed. So um, in, in order to be self-sufficient, they do um, Someone helps out at the incinerator every day in the morning and the afternoon. They burn through their um, any, any anything that needs to be disposed of on campus. So I got to see that happening right when I arrived. Um, Megan, my roommate, I met her covered in ash, but it was, it was a great, great, great first experience. Um, so to talk a little bit about what I did while I was there, so I did really get to enjoy the volunteer life. Um, I got to see what a volunteer at LCS does on a daily basis and participate in their community. Um, they were great at welcoming in, me into that community. They had been together for, at that point, eight or nine months. Um, so for them to welcome a new member, um, they did an unbelievable job of making me feel like I was at home. So in the top left is a picture of the um, cafeteria where we received our meals. Um, in the morning and the afternoon, we ate meals prepared by the Haitian staff. 
Um, so we would go in, get online with the students and grab our meals, and then we would come back and eat them at the Palais before we headed off for the day. So um, at night, we would cook meals. The volunteers were on a rotating schedule, as was with all of the cleaning of the house and making sure that everything was kept up to date. So um, I helped out wherever someone, if someone wanted to go cover a class or um, had an, a test that they needed to prepare for, I helped out when needed. Um, so I was, it was a great way to stay a part of that volunteer life. Uh, to the right is um, a picture of me and the volunteers at morning prayer. Um, so as was said before, we had morning prayer and evening prayer. So in the morning, a homily was read to us by Deacon Moynihan, um, and we would, we would sit there and reflect on it and figure out how that really related to what we were doing there, um, how it related to our lives here, how it related to what we could do once we got returned home. And in the bottom left is a picture of the Team Moon program. Uh, there's actually a student there, uh, a LCS student, teaching the T-Moon children. The T-Moon is um, the Childhood Development Program on campus. So as I said before, they offer uh, this opportunity for children from the neighborhood to come to LCS during the day, um, get an education in some way, and also they have, they're always doing music lessons or singing, something like that, just to um, make them feel a part of the community that LCS is developing. And to the right, in the afternoons, after all the classes are done, they do have a few student activities going on. So uh, they have, as I said before, soccer practices. They have sports teams. They have uh, dance, dance teams and dance lessons. They have uh, singing groups on campus. So I got to see, as I was there at the end of the year, I got to see all of their performances. Uh, this is the Team Moon's dance, uh, dance recital at the end of the year. They said, it, uh, we were talking to them afterwards, and they said, it was such a great opportunity for them because normally only the rich kids were able to uh, have dance lessons. So for them to have their own um, ballet costumes and their own ballet shoes, it was really a treat for them. It was also great. They had, um, since the Team Moon, are um, they're tutored by the older students on campus. So the older students all came in and piled, in the, piled into the chapel to cheer them on. The, the, their excitement for these children to be performing and doing something that they love was incredible. Uh, but I also did a lot of work. So while I was there, um, I tried to participate in the work hours as much as I could. So I would really be a part of the community. So in the mornings, I would, for an hour or two, I would work outside and help out with the work hours. So I would work alongside students and we would do anything from uh, sifting through rocks or the project in the top left is we were build, uh, digging a trench uh, which would eventually be made into a flower bed. So we were digging out rocks and concrete, sifting through it and sorting it um, so it could be used elsewhere along campus. Um, so we had a rock crusher which I only had to use once. Um, I was not that strong so they didn't let me keep that job. Um, but uh, I worked with Deacon Moynihan on that one day and we took concrete blocks uh, that were found around campus and we crushed them using the rock crusher, and we used that leftover stuff to make the cement for the wall pour, which the um, immersion trip did. So right next to the rock crusher, we had um, an Our Father and Hail Mary uh, written on the wall, just to remind everyone what the reason was they were participating in this community, uh, the importance of it, and just a great reminder as they were sweating and pouring, they are dripping sweat and working their butts off. Um, and in the bottom left is where uh, I actually spent a majority of my time. Uh, that is the computer lab. So I was lucky enough that the Father Smith Fellowship grant, granted me the opportunity to bring a laptop down with me and use that to research while I was there. So I used my laptop to do research on the cell phone industry in Haiti. This was a project that Deacon Moynihan, the uh, president of the Haitian Project, came up with, and it was something that I focused on for the majority of my time while I was there. Um, so in Haiti, 80% of the people there uh, live on less than $2 a day. Also, more than 80% of the population has access to a cell phone. So I was looking into the disparities between those two numbers and exactly what the cell phone industry was doing in Haiti. Obviously, connectivity is something really important and that is useful everywhere, but we were looking into exactly what the uh, telephone industry was doing there, um, 
what were the benefits of it and what was their huge presence um, and their impact on the lives of the individuals. So Digicel uh, owns about 90% of the market. So there were Digicel signs everywhere, tents set up about every 100 yards or so. Uh, they were selling minutes to customers. So getting the minutes was really easy for them. They were all prepaid, cell uh, you pay as you go cell phones. So um, for them, they could put as little as five goods, which is about 12 cents onto their cell phone and use that. Uh, what I found was that spending on healthcare in Haiti, for every dollar that was made produced by the cell phone industry, 93 cents went to healthcare, was spent on healthcare. Um, in the United States, for every dollar that is produced by the cell phone industry, uh, $13.50 go to healthcare, is spent on healthcare. So that was a huge disparity. I looked into many different things while I was there, including um, healthcare and comparing Haiti and other developing countries um, and figuring out what exactly the cell phone industry was doing. So in order to eventually come up with a research paper, I needed a little bit of help because I am not an economist. Um, so with the help of Deacon Moynihan's connections, I was able to get in contact with Darren Ace Moglu, uh, Gregory Mankiw, and a U.S. Treasury advisor who helped answer any of my economics questions. Um, so they were huge, they're huge resources for me. Uh, Darren Ace Moglu and Gregory Mankiw are well-known economists. They're actually known on a worldwide level. Um, so it was an unbelievable resource for me uh, as I was figuring out what exactly I needed to look into. I also needed to understand the cell phone industry a little better. So I talked to top officials and employees at Digicel um, just to understand what their motives were, um, what plans were being offered to the Haitians and how, um, how they could pay for their phones and what were the different things that were being done. So a lot of people claim that mobile banking is an unbelievable benefit for the Haitians. So I wanted to figure out what exactly um, mobile banking was offering them, who was using it, um, and little things like that. So I also needed to figure out how mobile banking was playing into the banking industry itself. So Soja Bank is, uh, a, the biggest, largest bank in Haiti. So I was able to talk to their CEO and their general, general controller um, there. So they provide an unbelievable insight into the financial uh, status in Haiti and the economic situation. Once I gathered all of that information, I was able to go out and actually survey um, about what ended up being 400 Haitians. So I started off surveying, surveying 100 students at LCS, so I got uh, a student perspective. I, got, I was able to have someone at the school go and survey 100 university students to figure out their spending habits and their cell phone usage. And then I went to two companies, or three companies, I'm sorry, Batumat, Manutech, and CRS, and I was able to get the perspective of 100 professional staff members and 100 non-professional staff members professional staff members to figure out their spending habits and what exactly they were doing. Um, it, was, it was harder for me to go to those companies because obviously I don't speak Creole, so I had uh, two translators help me, um, two former graduates of LCS. And we eventually came, produced a research paper on the topic of the cell phone industry in Haiti. I have a copy with me if anyone is interested in looking at it, um, but it was nice to come out of there with a finished, completed project and something to prove exactly, something to show my progression throughout my trip there. It was also great, I'm sorry, I should have. I'm a, as a finance major, it was a great way for me to see how my major is going to uh, play into my faith and what were the connections between the two. Um, I'm not exactly sure what I want to do after I graduate, but that definitely gave me a better idea of what the possibilities are and what I can use my Providence College education um, for in the future. So. On my last days, uh, we were able to kind of celebrate the end of the year and celebrate um, all the work that was done throughout the year. So in the top left is a traditional Haitian meal called fritai. It took us about three or four hours to prepare, but I worked alongside the Haitian staff members, and they told us a little bit about, um, they talked to me about their traditions and 
their own eating habits. Uh, they had spaghetti for breakfast on Monday mornings, and we, they didn't understand why that was weird for us because we only have spaghetti for dinner. Um, little things like that, it was a great way to form the connection, get to know a little bit more about the Haitian culture. And then on the right is a picture of all of the staff members um, who participated or who were at the party. Um, again, it was just a great end to the year. I was also able to use my soccer expertise in some way. Uh, the varsity boys soccer team had a, a match against their rival school on my last day there, and I was able to go and help referee. Um, so I refereed in a different country. Um, it was a great experience. The competition was so amazing, and even though there was, even though there was such tension between the two teams, they still held themselves and the, the Lewisher Cleary students held themselves with such great character. And you could tell that they really were proud to be representing their own school. Um, just to close, I just wanted to say uh, thank you all for providing this opportunity for, for me. Um, thank you to everyone who has supported me along the way. Father Rob for all of your help um, in developing this project and making it possible. Um, my family and friends and the PC community. Without it, I would not um, have had this unbelievable experience. It was so great uh, to be able to take what I learned at PC and apply it on a global scale, and um, it was just a life-changing and amazing experience. But if you do have any questions, uh, this is my email and also a link to my blog where you can learn more about the, my, my life on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as Claire and Scott's email and uh, a link to the campus ministry blog. We might uh, just have, well, we have a couple minutes anyway. Anyone have any questions uh, they'd like to ask right now? Well, for the video. So is it? If, if a Dominican tells me to do it, by gosh, I'm going to. Uh, I'm just curious, what would the educational alternatives be for poor kids like this if they were not able to go to that particular school? Is there public education at all in Haiti, or you know, what are the alternatives, basically? Yeah. So most of the education was provided um, by private institutions. So education is not a requirement past a certain age. I believe only about 50% um, of students living in Haiti um, move on to go to um, uh, like what would be, we would consider high school. Um, and that is something that they have to pay for out of their own pocket. Uh, as for uh, the Haitian project in the Louisville Clear School, what is unique about that is that they don't have to pay for that education. So they can use that money to um, maybe finance future education or um, use it to kind of um, sustain their lives. Could any of you tell me how students are selected to go to school? What is their process for acceptance? So there is an interview process for it. Um, they do try to choose students who are academically um, gifted. So they choose students from all throughout Haiti. They apply to go to the school. They look at the applications, um, see their qualifications, and then uh, the, someone, a representative from LCS, actually goes to their homes um, and figures out the situation in which they're living, and they take all factors into consideration for that. Did any of you have direct experiences with students in the classroom, either teaching, tutoring, that yeah. kind of involvement? Uh, yes, we did. When I went down, although I was only there for two days, um, Scott and I and some of our other group members were able to sit in on some of the classes. Um, one class that I sat in on was an economics class, which was really interesting for me to um, listened to because I had previously taken economics uh, the semester before I left um, and they were doing the same exact thing that I learned here at PC and they were in high school which made me feel a little bad about myself but <laughs> um, they, they were they were really learning everything that um, a college student learns and 
the economics class in least. I didn't see any of the Spanish classes, but I know one of the other um, students that came with us on the trip was a Spanish minor, and he sat in on one of the Spanish classes and was able to have a conversation with some of the students um, in fluent Spanish, and he was very impressed with their language skills. I have a two-part question. A, is this model based upon another successful school model elsewhere in a third world uh, country? A, and B, is there any evidence that students have come back and contributed to the uh, building of their country? As far as I know, I don't know if it was really a tested model beforehand, um, but it is something LCS has uh, been around for quite some time now. I believe they opened up in 1989, am I right, Sunny Day? 88. 88, okay, so I was off by a few years. But um, since then, uh, they have had students who have gone on to be doctors, to be lawyers, and have participated elsewhere in the community. So they have had some success stories uh, with people coming back and um, producing, uh, coming back educated and um, helping the community. One more question for anybody? I'm curious about your decision to participate in this program, and if it was something that you thought as individuals, first of all, Claire, Molly, Scott, tremendous. Was there something that was sort of in you before you came to Providence College that made you want to take advantage of an opportunity like this, or was it an experience, or what was the germination of the idea that said to you, you know, this is something I'd really like to get involved with? I'd just like to understand sort of what your motivations were. As far as me, um when I came to, if you told me the summer before I came into PC that I was going to spend four weeks in Haiti by myself, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, that was not something I was planning on doing in any way. Um, but I think it was just the, once I got here, realizing the community that PC has and that feel, I wanted to be able to show someone elsewhere um, how that can be done and take my faith and take the faith, the education, the service, and apply it elsewhere um, and really grow from that. I had grown so much since I came to PC and I wanted to continue that um, in another location. Uh, similar for me, I had no idea going um, into PC that I was going to have an experience like this abroad. I had planned on studying abroad. Um, but I didn't think I was going to be doing any sort of service trip. And I actually first had the idea I wanted to go to South Africa um, and do a Smith Fellowship. But then I actually ended up doing the Haitian immersion trip instead. Um, and I don't, it just kind of came to me one day, and I had seen the flyers around, and Father Cuddy had always raved about how great LCS was, and it sparked my interest. And I did a little online research. and decided I really want to go see this place and I'm so glad I did because it was an absolutely life-changing experience and I would love to go back. Um, for me, I think it was something that I really learned at PC um, where through campus ministry especially, they make these opportunities available. Um, and once the opportunity is available, it's kind of hard to, you know, say no. Um, <laughs> It, uh, but in the in the good way that um, <coughs> excuse me that you know this happened a week after um, uh, commencement a week after commencement um, and so you know what you know I'd be home you know doing nothing until <laughs> you know my summer job started so you know PC makes this opportunity available for students to go and serve um, to serve others um, at the same time you know. I think you can tell from our testimony that you know it's been a life-changing experience for us, um, and so you know helping others while also knowing that we will benefit um, as well. I want to thank uh, Claire. I want to thank Molly, and I want to thank Scott um, for putting this presentation together for us. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, there are just, why don't you sit down. There are a few people um, I would like to acknowledge before we finish up. The first of those is Father Gabriel Pavarnik, who is the new Vice President for Mission and Ministry. He also continues as the Director of the Center for...
Catholic and Dominican studies next door, and in his spare time, he's an assistant professor of theology. So he runs in many directions. <laughs> Father James Cuddy is a member of the class of 1998. He is uh, our college chaplain and director of campus ministry. Uh, he's in his fifth year now in that position. And he and Rich Lumley, one of our former campus ministers, uh, did the initial trip um, to Haiti uh, to put together uh, these programs. And I uh, want to acknowledge he, he really is tops as chaplain of the college. <clears throat> Heidi Kenny here in the, the blue is uh, the new chair of the trustee committee on Catholic and Dominican mission. Um, she grew up in the neighborhood and actually came to college here graduating in 76. Um, she had two uncles who were members of the Dominican community here at Providence College. Maureen Davenport Corcoran Class of 79, Maureen had four uncles who were Dominican priests, and two of them are buried right here in the cemetery. Maureen is a trustee of the college. Um, she's also a member of the trustee committee on Catholic and Dominican mission. Uh, she snatched $75,000 from State Street Bank. She was the chief financial officer. And, uh, the, you know, which is the largest donation to the Smith Fellowship Program. And now she's retired. And she's basically gone to work as a volunteer uh, in our institutional advancement operation. She has other things she's doing in retirement. Uh, standing back uh, there at that door is Ryan Frazier. Um, he spent six weeks... Uh, down under this summer is a Smith Fellow, four of them in the Solomon Islands. Over on this door is Kate Mulvihill. She spent six weeks in Sydney and other places in Australia as a Smith Fellow this past summer. Uh, Julia Tully, stand up. Ju Julia is uh, one of our early Smith Fellows. She went off as a pioneer uh, to Kasumu, Kenya, in the summer of 2010. Um, she's now graduated and uh, on doing other things, but service remains uh, one of her principal uh, life goals. Um, I really thank you for coming here today. Um, all of this that we have shown you is done through the generosity of alumni and friends of Providence College. Uh, the Smith Fellowship Program, which provides all expenses for the Smith Fellows, 10 fellows went off and uh, uh, con contributors like you provided almost $50,000 for that. In terms of campus ministry, this past year we spent $88,000 of contributed money uh, for our immersion programs. Some of them were domestic, like Habitat for Humanity and our New Orleans immersion program, and the two new global immersion programs, the Haitian Project, as well as a larger group of students, 13 with two campus ministers, who went to Jamaica in the same week and worked with uh, Mustard Seed, a, a rather acknowledged Jamaican program, um, you know, serving the poor. Um, we spent a total of $88,000 in contributed monies for those programs. Uh, the students themselves and some fundraising contributed another $62,000 to that whole operation. But most of the stuff that we do this way relies on the 
great generosity of alums and friends of Providence College. So on behalf of all of our students who have benefited from this this past year and the ones who are going to be benefiting in the coming year, I just want to say thank you to all of you. Now it seems that the sun is going to half shine. We have had someone monitoring the Doppler radar since 6 a.m. this morning. Uh, they are set up for an outdoor dedication of the Ruane Center. Uh, there's also a second set up in the circus tent behind the library. Uh, and they're going to make the call at 10 minutes until 12. But I thank you for being here, and please enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>